أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالتاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى لن فصام لها والله سميع عليم There is no compulsion in religion Guidance has become distinct from error So one who disavows the tyrants and has faith in Allah has held fast to the firmest handle for which there is no breaking and Allah is all hearing, all knowing. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا And say the truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Indeed, fa falsehood is bound to vanish. The, the worldly life, the worldly life is based on many constants and criteria. And in this life that we live in, everything we do is based on these constants. So for example, there are certain laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, physical laws that have been created in this world, that we have no choice but to abide by. And if we disobey these laws, then we pay the consequences regardless of our knowledge of the laws or not. Such as the laws of gravity, such as the laws of thermodynamics, the laws that govern heat and the transfer of heat from a body to a body, the laws of buoyancy, for example, the laws of radiation, that we have to abide by these whether we like it or not. And these laws are the basis of the way our lives are created and built and governed. So, for example, with the law of gravity, the law of gravity is the law that speaks about the attraction that the earth has to the planets that are around it and the moon and, and, and all the rest of it. So this level of attraction creates a force, a downward force towards the earth. This force is then how we calculate, for example, our weight. How much do we weigh? It's based on gravity. So if the gravitational pull was to change, then our weight is going to vary. If our weight changes, then we have issues in everything, in our health, in our medicine, in the way that we conduct all of our day-to-day -day operations based on this gravity. Another example would be for uh, the laws of, of thermodyna thermodynamics, the laws of heat transfer. If these laws were manipulated even slightly, then we would have an issue with the way everything functions. The laws of gravity also govern our, our systems of engineering, the structures that we build, etc., etc. If these things were to change just a little bit, then everything that we have would change. In fact, we have a, a system in place known as the SI system or the standard, uh, the standard units. SI stands for the meaning of standard units in French. And so we work in Australia on the metric system. So if we look at the meter, what is one meter? This one meter or the original one meter or the meter that all our meters are based on is stored in some holding place in France. It's, it's a titanium or a, a titanium alloy, which is the length of a meter. Now, if this, this was any other piece of metal or something and it was to expand or to contract, then every meter in the world has changed. So, for example, if your house is 400 meters squared, if this meter was to change, then that would also change. Your house in one day could become 300 meters squared or 350 meters squared. You might lose 50 meters squared. All of a sudden, we can't calculate the speed based on this metric system. So your vehicle doesn't have the same speed that it should. That there are systems in place that keep these values constant for everything to work in harmony. For everything to have the ability to continue to function as it should. For example, in terms of thermodynamics, we say zero degrees is the temperature that water is at liquid. And 100 degrees... Is the, so zero degrees is just before it freezes, it's still liquid, and then at zero it becomes frozen. And that 100 degrees is the point that water begins to boil. And therefore this is how they keep that, this is what zero is and this is what 100 is. At that temperature the water boils. If, for example, the properties of water all around the world were to change, 
then the way we measure the way the way we measure heat would also change Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every human being with what is called a fitra and the fitra is like a bios it's like a firmware anyone that deals with computers will know what a bios is it's like the information that's implanted or installed into the motherboard or the firmware anyone that's a bit of a a, a, a phone hacker or something like, like that that plays with with phones and these instruments or even anyone that's tried to jailbreak an iPhone will understand that within it is a certain firmware and this firmware is built so it should not be manipulated because this firmware is how the whole system operates in the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has installed a firmware into the human being this firmware is called the fitra that every person that is born has a fitra and this fitra is what leads them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for had it been that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want us to know who he is then we would never have known who he is and this is why it says in the holy quran well in sa'altahum man khalaqa samawati wal ard yaqulun allah that when you ask them who created the earth and the, he the, the heavens and the earth they'll say to you allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there's something in their heart that always brings them that back towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's a famous saying in the military where they say that there is no atheist in foxholes a foxhole is that hole you dig out to to um, protect yourself when when you're getting shot at and so they say there's no atheist in foxholes because when it comes close to death everyone all of a sudden believes in God that in any great calamity you see around the world even in the most unbelieving nations you'll see that they all cry out to their God or if there is a God or if there is a creator and they'll say oh God helps help us this why this is because this is the fitra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us now this fitra is a constant this fitra is a constant it's a constant that allows us to always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this constant allow us to, allows us to know good from evil bad from good this constant is a criteria in itself this is the al uh, al batina the intellect the intellect which contains the fitra that allows you to know good from bad so this fitra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within us is meant to be a sort of guide but along with this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 124,000 prophets throughout history to guide mankind to guide people to teach them what is right and what is wrong what is good and what is bad what will take you to paradise and what will keep you away from paradise what will allow you to enter this paradise what will allow you to enter the fire of hell when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first created the paradise and he created the fire of hell the angels saw the paradise and said wow they were so elated by how beautiful this paradise is that they said there is no way except everyone on uh, that you create will want to enter this paradise and then he created the fire of hell and the angel said we can't imagine anyone that would want to enter such a horrific place and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the reason people will enter paradise or the fire of hell is because paradise is surrounded by trial and hardship that for you to enter paradise you must go through some sort of trial and there is some patience and some hardship good deeds to get through to get to paradise however the fire of hell is surrounded by desires that if you follow your desires then you've got a fast track to the fire of hell and so this is why some will go here and some will go there the problem is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the holy prophets the response of the people was that if we have a prophet ph then we have no more prophets f that we lose our prophets if we obey and follow the prophet amir al-mu'minin has a very nice saying he says afdal an-nas 'inda allah man ka man kana al-'amal bil-haqq ahabba ilayhi wa in naqasahu wa karrathahu min al-batil wa in jarra ilayhi fa'idatun wa zadahu that he says that the best of the people in the eyes of Allah are the ones that do what Allah loves even if it's to their own harm that Allah loves this but it doesn't make much money Allah loves this but it could be disastrous to me the ones that love that more than they love the wrongdoing the batil even if the batil brings them wealth and brings them uh, honor and brings them distinction or honor among, uh, as in worldly honor among the worldly people this is the best of people in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the problem is 
When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophets and the messengers to warn the people and to, to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did they do? It says in the Holy Quran, أَفَكُلَّمَا جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ بِمَا لَا تَهْوَىٰ أَنفُسَكُمْ أَسْتَكْبَرْتُمْ فَفَرِيقٌ قَتَلْتُمْ وَفَرِيقًا عفوا, وفريقن, فريقن كذبتم وفريقن تقتلون. That he says that every time I sent you a prophet that wasn't to what your desires specified, then you either called him a liar or you killed him. Now if we have a look at some of the prophets and some of the stories of the prophets, Nabi Zakaria for example, the people, they didn't want to listen to him. So Nabi Zakaria, eventually they wanted to kill him. So he attempted to flee from them. Now imagine this, that this prophet has realized that I understand you guys don't want to listen, so I'm going to run now. I'm not going to stay here with you. I, refuse, I won't speak to you anymore. Don't worry, but it's too late. Because the wicked person can't live if he knows the good person is still around. So they follow Nabi Zakaria until Nabi Zakaria gets to a tree. And this tree opens up for him. And it says to him, come inside and hide. It's a prophet of God. He enters and the tree closes in on him. Now the tradition says either a bit of his cloak was outside of the tree or Iblis himself came and said to the people that within this tree is Zakaria. Cut it down. So they begin to cut down the tree until they saw that prophet in half. That imagine the punishment that this prophet went through. And he was patient through this punishment. In fact, an angel came down and said, if you do not scream, you will be counted as of the patient ones. And so he didn't make a single sound. And he was sawn in half. That these people, even though the prophet, he just came to tell them to do good. They chased him to kill him, even though he attempted to escape and run away from them. You look at Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Nabi Musa, they mocked him. They mocked him that you have been raised in the house of Pharaoh and now you're going against Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said to his companion, Haman, he says to him, build me a ladder or a stairs or a tower high enough so I can go into the sky and battle the God of Moses. And then when Nabi Musa eventually saved the people, the Banu Israel, and he took them and he allowed them to cross the river. In the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he said their feet hadn't even dried from the river. And they saw some people worshipping idols. So they said, O Musa, build us an idol like the idol of these people. We want to worship a God like that God. And we're talking about after all the signs that he showed them. The frogs and the locusts. The water turning into blood, etc., etc. So many signs that he, that, that he portrayed to them and they refused to accept. No Eventually, what did they come up with? They left him and they called themselves Yahud. They said, we are the Jews. We are all the sons of God. We are all the family of God. We are the chosen people of God. This is what they said and they left Nabi Musa alayhi salam. They left him and in fact, ultimately, they warred against him and they fought against him until eventually they got rid of him. So they mocked and humiliated and killed until they got rid of him. These people that accepted these actions and went through these actions slowly, slowly began to distort their fitrah. This bias that was within them, this firmware that was within their heart, began to get distorted and they passed it on from father to son. From father to son until we see at the time of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, when Jesus came to the people with the same thing. But they kept trying to tick, trick Jesus. So, oh, you, so you're saying you're the new king of Israel? And he says to them, my kingdom is not of this world. Why? They wanted him to say just one thing so they could go to the Romans because the Romans had owned the whole area and it was just that, that part of what they used to call Judea or next, uh, close to Jerusalem where the Jews used to live. And so when Nabi Isa came, they, they wanted to trick him with one word just so they can go tell the Romans that look at what Nabi Isa is doing, kill him. Because the Romans said he's no trouble to us. This guy sleeps on the floor, he doesn't bother anyone. He gives charity. He's not very rich. Doesn't look like he has an army. He's no issue. To us, he's no issue. And so they continually, then they said to him, what should we do? Should we uh, pay our taxes to, to Caesar, to the Romans? And he tells them, give, what, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. They give Caesar whatever is his. So if this dollar is his, give it to him. So he always had to go around them with a different answer because they just wanted him to do the wrong thing. And then eventually... Eventually, they tried their best to kill him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him away. However, they thought that they crucified him. They crucified a person and then they thought, what are we going to do now that we've crucified this person? Here's an idea. Let's worship him and say that he died for all of our sins 
And now we can do anything we want. And then Emperor Constantine said, you know what, that's a great idea. Let's integrate it into our paganism. And thus you have the Catholic Church. Imagine a religion where they follow a prophet, a great prophet of God, who used to dress with the poorest of clothes, who had a long beard and long hair, who used to sleep on the floor, look after the sick and the orphans, and go and look at who the head of church is now. Or at any time, a man who drives, who drives around in a bulletproof vehicle, who wears gold, who has a golden staff and a golden hat and custom-made shoes, etc., etc. Is this the same follower of that? Absolutely not. Would it be safe to say, for example, that Jesus was a Christian? This is how far they distorted it. They can't even say that Jesus was a Christian. How can you say Jesus was a follower of Christ when he is Christ? How can you say Moses was a Jew, for example? All of them were Muslims. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his final messenger and prophet. Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad ibn Ali Muhammad. And then the Holy Prophet came down with the completion of the message. That I validate what happened with Moses and I validate what Jesus said and this is the new message. This is the, the complete religion. That I have come to you with the complete religion. And so they mocked him. But he was a sadiq al-ameen. So they couldn't say he's a liar because everyone knew that he was truthful and he was trustworthy. So what did they say? Sahir, majnoon, he's crazy. He's a magician. This is just magic that you see. His miracles are magic and he is someone that is crazy. And then that didn't work, so they started putting traps for him on the road to hurt him. And that wouldn't work, so when he was praying, they used to, when they used to cut open a sheep and all the muck that would come out of the sheep, they would go and throw it on him while he's praying. That this is the pressure that they placed under the Holy Prophet and the hardship and the difficulty that they did to him. And, and, and this is after placing him in that valley of Abu Talib where... They were persecuted and sanctioned. No food was allowed to come to them. No water. No one was allowed to deal with them. Anyone that would even say salam to the Holy Prophet would be sanctioned by the mushrikeen. They would say, all right, we will not marry from this person. We will not trade with this person, etc., etc. This is the hardship that, I, that the Holy Prophet underwent. And the injustice intensified. The degree of injustice intensified. That imagine... The Holy Prophet, the religion of Islam. And go and research it. Don't worry about what, what it is that they teach you in, in, in school, what, what, what happened in history, or who the victors of history are. We know that the, the ones who are victorious in history, the ones who write the history, sorry, are the winners. And the material winners are the ones that write history. Go and have a look, for example, in November the 11th, the 11th of the 11th, what was it? Memorial Day. Memorial Day, where we were meant to have a, a minute of silence at 11 o'clock. And they go and remember the veterans, the people who died for our freedom, apparently. So you go and have a look in the United States and all they talk about is World War II. You know why? Because there's only a handful of World War II veterans left. Do you think they'll talk about Vietnam? They're going to go and show that all of these injured soldiers that they never looked after? In Australia, they're going to talk about Vietnam? What were they doing in Vietnam? Other than killing and raping and maiming and burning and pillaging. That's what was happening. Go and see. What freedom were they fighting for? They talk about even World War I sometimes and they try and tell us, you know, at the Anzacs and Tobruk and Gallipoli. What happened in Gallipoli? Young men were forced to go into Turkey for no reason whatsoever and get killed. This is what happened. So what freedom, what, what values were they fighting for? And today when they sit down and talk about the veterans of World War II, who's left? Not the grunts, not the soldiers on the ground. Some of the Air Force pilots, the bombers that used to go and bomb Innocent people, villagers, go and look at what they used to bomb. This is the types, these are the types of injustice. The true civilization began with the Holy Prophet Muhammad And brothers, this is not something I'm making up. Go and have a look. That today, they tell you of the most civilized and humane nations. Australia, for example. Australia was a prison colony where they used to bring children who had stolen a loaf of bread or a comb. And the only reason they used to bring them here is because there wasn't enough room in prisons in the, in the United Kingdom. And the other punishments were for children that did this, hanging. They would hang the child. So they didn't have enough room, so they moved forward. This is only what we're talking 200, 250 years ago. At the time of the Holy Prophet, even when Mecca was full of pagans, he would go and send money to them, to the poor of them. 
and help them, the poor mushrikeen. He would pay and help the poor mushrikeen. Who had ever heard of that? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Mecca, what did he do? He freed all of his enemies. He allowed them to be free. Look at the mercy of the Holy Prophet. Even in fact, there were some of them that were heavy enemies of his. The son of, of uh, Abu Jahl, for example. Akrama, the son of Abu Jahl, was someone who was a, a great enemy of the Holy Prophet. The Holy Prophet forgave him. And this person became a Muslim and later, later laid his life down for the religion. But the point of the matter is that the Holy Prophet taught this kindness. The Holy Prophet taught this charity. And after the demise of the Holy Prophet wasallam, for 30 years there was a moratorium. No one was allowed to say any hadith about the Prophet. Why today do we come back and, and, and people say, why do they have such a distorted image of Islam? Why do we see that they don't understand who the real Holy Prophet is? Because for 30 years, no one was allowed to, to say any hadith about him. The only ones that were spread were the ones that were sanctioned by the ruling party. The ruling parties were the first and the second and the third Khalifa at the time. And then we see the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen, where you see there was a, a, a realm of justice. That other than the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected Amir al-Mu'mineen to be the Khalif, at that time the people had actually come and they, ra they came and they raided the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen until they nearly stamped or stomped on Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein. And they said to him, please be our leader. We've had enough of this tyranny. We've had enough of this injustice. We know you, Abu al-Hassan, you are just. So Amir al-Mu'mineen becomes their leader. And what a leader Amir al-Mu'mineen was. Amir al-Mu'mineen was someone that would refuse to eat because he would say sometimes he wouldn't eat lavish foods like meat. He would say, because I'm the leader, and la'allahu, that maybe there's a possibility that in, in, in the Yamama or one of the provinces, there's somebody that doesn't have a loaf of bread or hasn't saturated his stomach. Maybe someone in my realm or my kingdom hasn't eaten, so I refuse to eat. Imagine that. Fancy that. That even in his realm, when he was leading, when he, when, in, during his reign, when he was leading, a Jewish man took him to court. And the Imam, who is the Khalif, the commander, was subpoenaed to court and he went to court. He went and stood as a defendant in court. Never would this happen. Never, absolutely never. Go and have a look if you see today uh, the, the, the things that have happened. If anyone tries to even go near a world leader, when the, the President of the United States comes to visit, they bring in special, special laws. They, yes, Australia is a peaceful country, etc. But there's special laws when the, when the head of state of the United States comes here. If you come or you want to protest, you can protest at some non, uh, indistinct park. But dare you come next to the motorcade of the president, I guarantee you'll be shot. You go and have a look at that, that Iraqi man that threw the, the shoe at George Bush. What happened to him? And they say we are in the time of, of civilization. We are, we are now in the, in the realm of, of the most humane time compared to that of Amir al muminin So what happened to these people? These people even rejected that. They didn't want that truth. Even though they were told, had you accepted Amir al-Mu'mineen from the first place, then you would, have, you, would have, you would have eaten from above your head and beneath your feet. Today, we live in a similar degree or a similar level of tyranny. There's so much more I would like to tell you about the tyranny that happened before. However, I'm really running out of time. But we lived in a we, today, we live in a similar degree of tyranny. However, today, it's sugar-coated. It's taken away. This is the problem. That our fitrah has also become distorted to a degree. That we don't see the good as good and we don't see the evil as evil. We see it the other way around. As I mentioned before, in comes the stance of Imam al Hussein. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this holy Imam with this mission. That the Imam knew he would be martyred, even though he spoke to them in the hope that he would convert them. But it would be like, for example, one of us going to some of the northern Syrian provinces and trying to convince uh, you know, people from the FSA or something like that to turn to the truth of Islam. There's a 99% chance you will be killed. They won't listen. But the Imam had to show the people why. Because the people were listening and agreeing with these Khalifs from Banu Umayyah who were drinking openly, who were committing fornication openly. This became a normal thing. People thought, hold on, that's not that bad. And you look at it even today, you have a look. There's certain things that are haram. The only reason we hate them is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates them. But then people come and say, you know what, we need to sanction 
these sorts of things. We need to compromise on homosexuality. What if they were born that way? We need to sanction alcohol. You know, maybe they might come up with an alcohol and they're working on it where, where you don't actually get drunk. We can't be like this. This is, you, you people are, are backwards. You're backwards. Be advanced like us. Be advanced like the Western world that you see before you. If this is advancement, that a country that is only five hours away from us gets devastated by a typhoon and has to wait five days and there's no relief, what sort of civilization are we talking about? And this is a country that is allied with the United States and allied with Great Britain and allied with Australia. They have an alliance. That, are, that These countries have to be complicit with their spying rings and c complicit with their targeted assassinations and killings. This is what had become. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Imam al Hussein to show it once and for all. Let me show you how clear this whole thing is. In case it's clouded and you don't understand and you can't see what's going on, this is the Imam, the grandson of the greatest creation of Allah. This is Hujatullah al al Khalq, who is standing before you, never harmed a soul. And in fact, the Imam says, If I have something that, that you owe me, that I am owing something, then come and take it from me. Have I killed or harmed one of you? Then come, come, let's hold it in a, in a legal gathering and take what you want from me. But no, had nothing to do with that. Could they not have let the Imam go? Go on his way? He asked them, let me go on my way. You don't have to kill me, but no. This is the true face of evil. This is the sinister face of evil. In, in case it didn't upset them much when, when the Umayyad Khalifs used to get drunk and want to pray while they are drunk. Or it didn't upset them much when the Umayyad Khalifs would kill certain people and say, this person is a heretic. Or even the first Khalif when he killed a certain person and he said, this person is a heretic. That this is someone that has gone away from religion that the people sat back and said, you know what, it's not me. And this is the problem. This level of indifference, this lack of, of hatred for injustice, this has turned us into a people who accept injustice. We accept it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I will send the greatest of the khalq, the grandson of the greatest of the creation, and show you an example in Karbala, that when you see it and when you hear about it, the coldest heart will be moved and your tears will be made to come out. And when you see it and you learn about it, you will develop a hatred of injustice. That this injustice, which I think is light, this is what it leads to. This injustice which is light leads to the killing of the likes of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, for example. On this field of Karbala, we see these great people. Ali al-Akbar is another example. These great shuhada, these great warriors who go out, who are the best of the people, who never harmed a single person or hurt a single person. And these people continue to show their cruelty and their cruelty until the Imam, salam Allahi alayhi, went to say goodbye to his six-month-old baby. That Imam al Hussein had a six-month-old baby, Abdullah al and he took him to say goodbye to the, to the baby. And he took the baby and saw that he was dying of thirst, that imagine. And he brings it towards the enemy and he says to the enemy, that this baby has done nothing against you, nothing to harm you. This shows the cruelty of this enemy that they had the ability and the right to say, okay, go on your way. Or just let the baby die of, of thirst. There wasn't long before the baby would have passed of thirst. He would have died of thirst. But instead, how did they answer the imam? With an arrow to the neck of the baby. That if you look at a baby, the softest part and the widest part of a baby is the neck of the baby. And the arrow that was sent was an arrow that was built to, to destroy and kill men. That even in, in our, in our pediatricians, when they give a baby an injection, they have a special needle that is made just for a baby. A small needle, this one, they used an arrow to kill men. And they killed the baby of Imam al Hussein before his own eyes in his own hands. Imam al Hussein takes a handful of the blood and throws it up into the sky. And he says, Oh Allah, if this is what pleases you, then take until you are pleased. This is Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Then Abu Abdullah al Hussein goes back to the camp. He goes back to his camp to see his woman folk and say goodbye to his woman folk. Imam al Hussein calls out to the women folk of the camp, Ya Sukaina, Ya Rabab, Ya Layla alaykunna minnis salam. And then he walks back towards the camp 
and they come to say goodbye to him. Sukaina comes and hugs him. His daughter Sukaina is crying. He places her to his chest. He says, Oh Sukaina, please do not cry over me. Please do not hit me when I am on the floor. The soul is still within me. I can't bear to hear, to hear you cry. Imam al Hussein then sees his sister Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab walks up to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. She smells his neck and she smells his chest. And she looks towards Medina and she says, Oh, mother, I have fulfilled my covenant that I have smelt the neck and the chest of Imam al Hussein as you had asked. Imam al Hussein gets on his horse and goes to battle the enemy. And he begins to fight the enemy and kills them one by one until it is reported that he kills 1800 of the enemy and he makes it to the water of the Euphrates. And as he's standing in the water, his horse looks at him as if to tell him that you are thirsty and I am thirsty. <laughs> Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein holds the water to drink from the water only after the horse has drank. And one of the enemy calls out, Oh Hussein, you are taking the light of the, of the water and they are attacking your women folk. Imam al Hussein drops the water. He doesn't get to drink and then he continues back towards the tents to protect his family. When Abu Abdullah al Hussein gets back towards the tent and he is fighting the enemy, one of the, en the enemies know that they cannot hurt him and they, they, they cannot, they, it's very difficult for them to kill him. And so Umar ibn Sa'ad says to the army, Woe unto you, you cannot take this man by yourself. Begin to throw stones at him. And so one stone hits Imam al Hussein on the forehead. And then one hits Imam al Hussein on the chest. And then one of the, one of the enemy with a three headed arrow throws it at the chest of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. It hits the chest of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein fills his, fills his hand with the blood and throws the blood towards the heavens. And then Imam al Hussein continues to fight. In fact, they say that there was no arrows in the back of Imam al Hussein, for he would only face the enemy and never have his back towards the enemy. Until one of the enemy hit him with a lance on his left side, and Abu Abdullah fell to the ground. <laughs> and the horse headed back towards the camp, it headed back towards the tent. And they realized that the Imam had been killed. Assalamu alaikum, ya Abu Abdullah. وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم عن السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to hasten the reappearance of our holy Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to have mercy on our dead and to cure our sick. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala. To guide us in the same way that he guides the righteous of his servants against their lower selves. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Rahmanullah man khara surat al-mubarak til-fatiha wa ahda thawaba al-arwah al-mu'minin wal-mu'minat. Sifat salat ala Muhammad.